Mini episode 544 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.info. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. 30 seconds. In front of all these people, you're going to pull out a gun and you're going to shoot an unarmed man. 20 seconds. So what are you going to do? 10. Welcome to the FDH Lounge and the Justified Episode Recap. It was justified. With your original dignitaries. Verno! Rick Morris and Jason Jones. You gotta ask cold water run through your veins. Breaking down each Justified episode the moment they've concluded. Did you take a peek inside the soul of Raymond and you? I'm just gonna let that old dog lie. Real time reactions. Next level analysis. You seem to be harboring a bit of hostility there, brother. So I've been told. And now, your dignitaries. Well, I believe we can take her from here. Welcome, everyone, to FDH Lounge Mini Episode number 544. We are breaking down Justified Episode 6.11. Rick Morris and Jason Jones are FDH Lounge analysts. Our examination of Justified tonight is, uh, I think, going to take some uh, very interesting turns, as the episode itself did. There, there's an awful lot that went on, as has been the case with the last couple of episodes of the series. And we are, of course, covering this not just for the FDH Lounge, but also for not just another TV site.com where I am the justified columnist. And uh, Jason, of course, uh, reviews many shows on that site. I, of course, also review uh, Better Call Saul, House of Cards, and uh, coming up shortly, Mad Men. So check all of that out on that site. But uh, again, Jason Jones, uh, after a, a one-week hiatus, back with us tonight for the usual format of the show. And uh, there were, I could tell from the texting back and forth between the two of us, some in, uh, elements tonight that, uh, again, continue to thrill and amaze the both of us. And I know Jason's going to have a lot to allude to once we get started here. Jason, my man, 6.11. Your thoughts right off the bat. What would you think? Well, my first thought has been clanking around in my head for the last 35 minutes or so is, when this is all over with, I have no idea how we're going to rank these episodes. I really don't. I'm absolutely beside myself with what has transpired tonight. Is this another one like the last two that probably belongs on the top tier all time when we start talking about episodes like Decoy and uh, the Bloody Harlan and uh, Shot All to Hell? Those are the three that I think coming into this season we had kind of held up there. To the last three weeks, I mean, have we doubled that top tier in the last three weeks, essentially? I think yes would be the answer to that. Uh, and then I would follow it up by saying I think that when this is all said and done, uh, you'll be able to look at any justified episode rankings. And, yeah, you're going to find shows like All Shot to Hell and Decoy. But I think the interesting thing, and this has been true of some other shows of late, is that if you took, say, a top ten, I'm almost willing to bet money that somewhere between four and six of that top ten are going to be episodes that we've seen in the latter end of this sixth season. I think it's going to be four, five, or six episodes from this season, and then the other remaining episodes on that list would be uh, spread out throughout the other previous five seasons. It could very well be, and uh, again, I'm going to allude to something Along those lines, I a couple times have uh, mentioned through the course of doing these shows with you that uh, I have a tendency uh, in the weekend leading up to uh, when Justified comes on for the next episode to sort of cheat a little bit, start my next review a little bit ahead of time, uh, and basically kind of gather thoughts on where we were coming from in the previous episode, where we're going in this one, and and, and make some stabs on what I think is going on. And I said something that I think could prove to be a tremendous mouthful, and that is for people who love these type of shows and the type of shows that are covered uh, and exemplified by not just another TV site.com, I think you could make a very strong case for tonight being the most anticipated non-finale episode of one of these shows 
since Osmandias for Breaking Bad, because that was the one where, of course, coming off of the climactic confrontation out there in the desert, you knew something very bad was going to happen with Walt and Hank, and it was uh, an agonizing week kind of leading up to that, to that next episode. This one, I don't know about agonizing so much, but the way it had gone with the two previous episodes, what they're trying to do with ending this thing with five firecrackers in a row, last week I, I thought managing to actually top the week before, probably uh, no worse than at least even with what they did the night before. To me, the anticipation for tonight to see if they could keep the momentum going, it's the most I have felt since Osmandias. I don't know if anybody else, and I'm leaving aside finales. You can't put finales in this mix, nor can you really put, I think, season premieres either. But uh, for, for, for the way that you were looking forward to this one, for the bar being as high as that, did it live up to it in your mind? Because I, I think it did in mine. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, um, whenever you have a dynamic like this where there's an episode that is not a finale leading into another episode that is also not the finale but has this level of anticipation, um, there had to be either a – a large series of events that led you to that sense or one big one. And I think we can make the argument either way. But for me personally, I would have been excited for this episode in general until Ava shot Boyd. And then I was over the moon. And then it's just a matter of how, how many more hours and minutes until we at least hope to get some closure on at least that moment. Uh, I mean, we can keep going uh, as far back as the beginning of that episode as to why this episode was going to be so um, anticipated. But, geez, uh, I absolutely, I think, lived up to it. And I think what we're seeing here, and I don't want to, I don't want to count the eggs before they're hatched here, but if we go back, uh, it, it wasn't even just last week and it wasn't even just the week before. It feels like a linear, incremental, and I just I, I don't know how much more we can actually expect from this, from this group here that puts this show on, but everything to this point has, has to lead you to believe that it will continue until you get to a crescendo of a finale, which is what we've all been holding out for. But this episode, the one before it, and the one before it, each one was better than the one before it, and I have no reason to believe that that trend won't continue. Well, that's crazy to to think that they could, and again, that's what I said going into this one here, to think that they could try and do that five episodes in a row at the very end. Uh, again, that is a, a truly, truly tremendous uh, feat, almost impossible, one would say, for them to try to, uh, to go for. But uh, again, they're sixty uh, percent of the way home in that last five episodes, and uh, so far they're making it stick. Uh, as, as the replay, of course, as we're, we're, we're recording this as we always do in real time, so I'm looking at the silent replay that is uh, playing on my screen here on FX with uh, Raylan and Boyd in uh, Boyd's hospital room there, and it's reminding me, of course, of the later scene in the episode with Boyd. I certainly want to want to get to the motor coach scene later because that was, I think the biggest one and the biggest holy crap moment in the episode and, and maybe one of the biggest in the whole series, the way that it played out. But as far as the commonality of that, it struck me just now looking at Boyd on the screen, you got to love the way that the writers of this show continually subvert expectations and make it work. We've talked about it previously with casting, about how they cast actors against type and they make it work. Uh, so they, they, they do it in that way. Tonight, they did it in a way where in, in both instances, in Boyd's hospital room and in, and in uh, the RV, one man had a gun held on him. That man would also be the only man to survive what happened in the room. Boyd manages to talk his way out of Carl holding the gun on him and finishes him off. And then in the stagecoach there in the RV, uh, Wynn is the last man standing, believe it or not. Uh, in, in the double murder with Catherine and Mike. Uh, it, it's, it's an amazing thing for them to be able to do something like this and, and, and keep the scenes from being too obvious in that way. It really, really is. You know, and that brings up another point that I was hoping we'd get to. It's not a major thing, but it's just 
I think it appeals to the sense of just how skilled these uh, showrunners are uh, from Grandiose all the way down. Um, and, and that is the entire time in his entire character's existence, we have always believed um, that Mikey, and I didn't know until today he didn't like to be called that, um, yeah. was just kind of, you know, a paid goon. He he, you know, he had a, an IQ that you could count on one hand, and we saw a different version of him. Now, he's still kind of slow. Now, there's no two ways about that. He's a guy that lives by code and all that. But at some point in that scene, and I don't, we don't need to go into great detail if we want to build to it later, but in that moment, you saw Mikey completely change and become something else, which brings me back again to this idea that how am I really supposed to believe that this wasn't articulated from the beginning? Um, and I, we've had these conversations multiple times where – each season is a new season, and they write fresh. But when you see something like this, it's either pure genius or this is something that the writers had in mind the entire time. Now, I'm willing to believe that it is is just that genius. But the fact that we completely underestimated Mikey the entire time, the entire time until you can make the argument your last episode and a half maybe, but for me – even though he was sticking to his code and he had handcuffed Win, I still believe that he was the same old guy. Uh, and in the end, he's proved to be uh, so much more than that. And whether it's genius from this staff or it was premeditated from the beginning, I don't know. But either way, it's brilliant TV making. Well, I didn't necessarily want to hold off the RV scene until later. We can talk about that now. I just wanted to make sure that we talked about it uh, in – in and of itself and not just as it related to the other scene because it deserves that kind of focus from us. I will say this. I agree with everything that you are uh, saying there about the way that it was built and, and the character of Mikey. And I go back actually to just over 24 hours ago as we're taping this and, and watching the penultimate episode of season one of Better Call Saul, and for anybody that's not watching that, you're really missing something great right now. There's something very similar that happened last night, and this is in the direction uh, that compares to what happened in the RV there. There was a, a critical scene last night that set up a big reveal at the end with, with Saul and with his brother, and there there was a scene where, where they kept kind of doing these subtle kind of pans to Saul's brother's face and it foreshadowed a revelation that was going to come out later in the episode, just these subtle kind of unreadable looks. We saw the same thing with Mikey. As Catherine was getting ready to finish him off, you got the sense that Mikey wasn't uh, going to exactly let it go down that way. Didn't think he'd literally end up taking a bullet for him, but the way that that scene played out, uh, and, and again, I knew when Catherine set the gun down, it wasn't going to be as simple as that. I wondered if... Catherine, due to her own weird kind of code, all these people have weird codes, definitely. I wondered if maybe she was going to gun down Mikey for trying to snitch out when. I, I kind of half wondered about that. I knew it wasn't going to be as straightforward as all that, but I didn't exactly know. And then it looks like she's going to kill when Mike, after these subtle kind of pans to his face, eventually steps in there. Eventually a violent struggle breaks out for the gun. Both of them end up dead. And all the while classical music another thing we didn't know about mikey or let's let's call him mike he deserves that respect in death <laughs> we didn't know that about mike until tonight that he liked classical music and uh, he took that opportunity to play it in the rv it's playing the whole time if that isn't one of the most surreal clearly one of the one of the top five surreal moments in the history of justified if not the most top uh the number one surreal moment the classical music playing as all of this is going down. I mean, what would you have bet coming into tonight's episode that we would have seen something like that? We would have never imagined it in a million years. I don't know where they conceptualize these things, Jason. I'm just continually left shaking my head like, oh, my God, that was just so awesome. Well, and here's the funny thing. To any of the, the listeners who are very um, educated or well-versed classical music, Fans, this is not going to be a huge stretch, but uh, for you and I, knowing each other, how's this for a parallel? 
not only was it classical music, but if I'm not mistaken, uh, that particular piece is called Canon in D and rather popular among the classical music community. Bet you didn't think I was going to peg that one. <laughs> but, no, you're absolutely right. I couldn't there, there, there was some artistry to the way that scene played out. The music, to be honest with you, w- was secondary for me. I didn't even pick up on that until the scene was almost over when when Wynn uh, sort of rolls after uncuffing himself. Uh, and there, there's kind of a moment there where even though, you know, things were different five minutes ago, there was a connection between those two men. And, and when I you know, actually, I think, might have spent a, a heartbeat or two actually mourning, which is something you know, I don't think I would have expected from him. Uh, but if we peel all the layers back, the artistry of the music, the the way it goes down, the the cinematography of seeing the mentality change in Mikey's head while Catherine is speaking about her code or whatever. All those things. Peel that all away. And you know what you're left with? And this is something that most people might not consider as you're watching it. Is there anything better than watching a guy, and it's normally a guy, uh, getting shot repeatedly and still keeps coming? There's just something dramatic, whether we're talking about a Revolutionary War movie, uh, Les Mis, or something like Justified, when you see a guy get shot repeatedly and he keeps coming, there's just something next-level dramatic about that, especially when the third person in the vehicle has a relationship with that guy, Uh, a professional as it may have been. It was just a dramatic moment uh, to watch that unfold and to see Mikey go to to the depths that he did to live by his code. Absolutely, and and die by his code, uh, and and again, uh, a, a real uh, piece of uh, honor certainly on his part there, and uh, you know doing you know uh, right by his boss in the end, even even for all of his boss's transgressions. What's very interesting also too, and 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 again, recording this in real time as the FX replay is is playing, where we're talking here about Catherine's death scene. And as I'm speaking to you live right now, I'm looking at the scene replaying of her and Avery, and that turns out to be, unbeknownst to us at the time, the goodbye scene, the final one between the two of them. I was surprised that Avery let her live after last week. It certainly didn't seem like it was going to go that way. But that scene was critical to helping us understand later on and the, the 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 very bitter feelings that Avery had at the end of the episode uh, on finding out that uh, Catherine uh, had died. That uh, even after all of that, he still apparently loved Catherine, I guess, as much as he could possibly love someone else, and uh, it will be, I guess, mourning her death. That's not something we would thought would have come out of last week, but you could tell how affected he was when Raylan broke the news to him at the end there. So. One wonders how that's going to affect Avery's state of mind and if that's possibly going to push him more towards a nothing-to-lose mentality. And if so, based on what we saw earlier in the episode, that can't be good for Loretta. Well, that is a mouthful to get through. Um, yes, I, even I, when you know, when Markham is talking about how he and his lady friend are going to run this county, there's a party that goes, oh, he doesn't know. Oh, this is going to get bad. <laughs> and then when, and this is just a testament to Sam Elliott's uh, acting ability, when he's told that information, you see the horror and grief grow from nothing to God help everyone else in his path from this moment on. And I think you're right about that. I think this is going to be, I, I'm not going to put money on it. I wouldn't stake any reputation on it. But I do get the sense that at this point, with no more Catherine left to fight for or to be with, one's got to believe that this becomes all or nothing with nothing to lose to get his money back and refocus his attention on something else, which probably then comes into his 
back to his plan of setting up shop in Harlan County and with Loretta being the one impediment to that goal now that Catherine's no longer in the picture. Uh, yeah, Loretta, to say Loretta could be in grave danger is a massive understatement, especially with Boone's interest in her. Yes, and again, we have always known that uh, that has always been a soft spot there with Rail, and that could be something that uh, distracts Rail in at the very end, as it really kind of did at the end of season two with uh, Bloody Harlan, which again, uh, that's the commonality. We talk about the uh, the greatest episodes in the history of Justified, and uh, there she was in that one playing a critical part, as it looks like she's going to. Uh, in the end game, I, I thought also too. While we're talking about this kind of stuff and direction, like like what they did with the, with the scene in the RV, uh, I was just taken also too by the, the the whole darkly lit scene of Raylan and Avery and Boone there in there. And you know, you're you're somebody who a lot of times brings up the whole Western. Uh, thing here and, and, and the motif of the show and, and, and how many times they go to the uh, uh, 10 paces kind of a thing here. I don't think we've ever seen a more literal example of that than Raylan and Boone staring down one another, ready to draw on one another before Avery says, hey, enough of this bull crap. we got business to talk about here. Uh, that's a moment that came as close to uh, personifying that kind of thing that you generally talk about in a metaphorical sense, almost more so than anything they've ever done. Yeah, up until this point, anytime we ventured into that discussion, it's always been, you know, Raylan and Boyd standing X number of feet apart. But they're just talking. Yes, you're, you're you are conjuring the images of of what it would be like if we were to erase away the background and, and replace it with an old West town. And that's where we get that analogy is, is many times in a metaphorical sense, you get the impression that Raylan is squaring off with someone. And if you want, we go all the way back to the opening scene of the pilot episode, but it's always been very metaphorical. And in this case, it's been building for a couple episodes, but in this case, Boone sought out a hat because he looked into the whole John Wayne thing, i.e. Westerns, and now there's a whole mentality that he's bringing to it, and he's just itching. He's looking for an excuse. He's looking for Markham to, to give him the order to do something so that he can square off with Raylan in a literal Western standoff. And you're absolutely right. Everything has been metaphorical up until tonight, and tonight uh, it stepped outside of the realm of metaphor and into a, a realistic, tangible one, albeit one that Markham, you know, squashed. But still, this was a almost a literal interpretation of the Old West standoff that we've seen conceptually on this show for so many seasons over. There are so many great things like that that they did that they applied to this episode tonight, and uh, again, with Avery uh, on the run, as uh, last week's uh, previews seemed to indicate what happened, she's out there with good old Zach Randolph applying his uh, post moves out there in the Kentucky woods, as he is wont to do, and out there uh, uh, in and around the vicinity of the mines. So as Ava and Zach Randolph are out there on the run, evading uh, capture, You've you've got Raylan, who doesn't want to come back to the office after being summoned by Art because he wants to continue uh, in the search. This entire thing, of course, precipitated with, with with Raylan having being summoned back to the office by Art. First of all, Art's back in service here for the end game of the series because Rachel's got, and and this might be the nicest way of saying it, a lot of egg on her face about everything that she has greenlit vis a vis the plan to go after using Ava as a confidential informant, et cetera. And the same kind of pressure right now is being felt by AUSA Vasquez. And after, I'd say about two seasons or so, maybe a little bit uh, longer than that, of a relative detente between him and Raylan, we see a little bit of the old dynamic coming back in tonight. AUSA Vasquez, a guy who used to be very, very suspicious of Raylan, ready to believe the worst in him, et cetera. Tonight, he's the one out there connecting the dots saying, 
hey, it looks like Raylan is in cahoots with Ava. He let her get away. Uh, he's, he's had a relationship with her previously, possibly maybe again. So that whole thing added one more huge dynamic into this and the notion of Raylan possibly even coming into uh, – uh, conflict with his employers, maybe in a tangible way, by the time the series is done. Yeah, you know, the first thought I've got on on Vasquez right now is, how does he get to this level in his career, making the such dumb, short sighted connections? And that's the only lack of realism I got from that. Was just there's no way a guy ascends the career path like this with, with that mentality. Um, and maybe it's because, as viewers, we have seen all of it, whereas Vasquez is a character and he's only privy to the information at his immediate disposal. Uh, but the big issue here is he's saying things that even he shouldn't believe. Yes, there was a relationship with Ava that goes back. And, and then there was a line about, well, maybe he's sleeping with her now. You have no evidence to suggest that. Nothing other than they had a relationship at some point of some duration at some point in history. So that's ridiculous. And I really do hope that at the end of all this, it becomes a situation where Art knocks him out. Because he basically walked in and said, although your guys are doing everything they can, instead of believing that, I'm just going to assume all the worst and I'm going to assume that you run a dirty office. So I've liked the guy for the most part, but he crossed a very serious line today, and all you had to do was look in Art's face during that scene to know exactly uh, how egregious those comments were. Well, the funny thing is, uh, again, doing this in real time, uh, silently the replay is playing on FX right now, and that scene, that very one, is it actually just started right as you were talking. And uh, so I'm looking at this wordlessly playing out again here. And, again, Vasquez kind of reverting back to how he was earlier in the series. And and that was the way that he had previously dealt with uh, Raylan and and had viewed him. And uh, injecting that dynamic back into the end game certainly is very interesting. I I don't know if this is – there, there's something about this, Jason, that's either a bad practice if it is actually done in law enforcement or maybe the show just got a little bit carried away creatively. And if they did, I'm not going to get on their case because it was great storytelling, but using somebody like Ava as a confidential informant, I'm not going to justify her taking the $10 million and running, okay? But as far as her not going along with the program exactly, if the government couldn't see – that her work in that game with Boyd was going to get her killed, then, again, Vasquez, Rachel, and everybody else should have their heads examined because to think that Ava would be capable of playing this kind of a long con on Boyd for that long, again, if the government really does things like that and puts people that close to the situation really in there, uh, in in no-win situations, then that's not a good thing that happens uh, and, and if the show did it uh, in a way that law enforcement generally doesn't, then that's creative liberties, but again, still, I think, great storytelling. You, you bring up a very interesting point, and uh, the only thing that I can add, not being a, an expert or aficionado in the, the topic you're, you're bringing up, is that to go back to other TV or other movies, and in most cases, when you have a confidential informant even if the deal is to get them out of jail, to put them back into the street uh, and have them inform on some bigger fish that they're after, the confidential informant in all of those scenarios is a bad guy or a, a former criminal, someone who has actively made the decision to live that life and, and be in the thick of it. Ava was never in the thick of it. I mean, she, she had done things. She knew about Devil, and um, Ellen May was was an issue. But she was never really a candidate, a strong candidate to be a CI. Uh, so you've got a point there, for sure. Uh, that was questionable the entire time. Um, and at some point, even as we had these recap shows uh, talking about Justified the Moment It Ended, 
this would not be the first time that we brought up the idea of just how long can she hold up and how long before this becomes a self-preservation situation, which seems to me exactly what it is. Absolutely. And again, given the way that uh, the area is being patrolled by a helicopter, one wonders how long that uh, her and Zach Randolph are going to be able to hold out while uh, law enforcement are coming and looking for them. Uh, one of the only things I think that we haven't mentioned thus far has been the, the whole thing with uh, the utter disposability, the disposability of uh, avoid tension because you have a situation where uh, we've talked about this throughout the course of the series that uh, these guys kind of come and go. Uh, Boyd doesn't seem to shed too many tears uh, when things go badly, uh, as long as it's not his own skin. You have a situation tonight where, again, hey, Boyd almost had me going there, you know, as far as when, when he promises Carl, hey, I'll give you half the money if you let me live. Carl springs him. They're getting ready to make their getaway together. And, uh, Boy realizes first and foremost that he has no intention of going ahead with the uh, the money split. Second of all, that uh, Carl's violent death will provide uh, the uh, distraction that he needs for a getaway. So there's there's a number of people out there. I know uh, FDH Lounge dignitary Ken Detweiler uh, among them, and uh, I'm hoping that maybe Ken will be able to join us for our season recap when this is all done. It'll be fun to add another perspective to this. Ken is a Team Boyd guy all the way. And Ken is, again, though, somebody with a very good uh, moral conscience. I know that a lot of people that are team Boyd, you can't necessarily say that for, but I just wonder how long it's going to take for the people who still really, really, really want to root for Boyd. Uh, to me, it's, it's, it's getting to be like the people are rooted for Walter White. And at what point in time do you say enough is enough? And gunning down another henchman tonight just because he could and just because it made his life a little easier – uh, it, it's another one of those moments I would think that would cause maybe some people to start to question that allegiance. No, absolutely. Um, there's, there's something to, I, I wish that there, there's a better way to articulate this, but the thing is we've always, always believed that, um, that it was going to come down to you're either Raylan or you're Boyd. And at some point, one's own internal moral compass, no matter how calibrated that may be, you've got to think that most people are going to come back to Raylan. And I understand Boyd's a great antihero. He is. I, I think maybe one of the greatest that I can even think off the top of my head, maybe ever. Uh, but in the end, He's still a really bad guy. He's just really good at being a bad guy. And I just can't imagine uh, siding with him if we're, if we're picking sides. Now, the, the other thing I'll say about that whole scene was, I'm right with you, getting sucked in by Boyd's charm, until he said the, the feeling I have for you and your brother. He's not cared about the younger brother. <laughs> they won. So right then I thought, oh, it, he's going to die. And, and again, self-preservation is what this is coming down to. Whether it's Ava, Boyd, or anybody else, they're going to do whatever they have to do to ensure their own personal safety and maybe even financial security. It is an interesting contrast. You know, you, you talk about that, you, you, the, the, the self-preservation of a Boyd Crowder. And it, for me, it almost tends to stand out a little bit more than usual on a night like tonight because... That scene in the RV that to me was going to go down as the defining one for this episode. You know, say what you will about Mike and about Catherine, but they died by the codes that they had. And I, I've laughed about the thing with Catherine before. It's okay for you to bang other guys, but you're upset if somebody kills your husband. <laughs> I'm not ever going to get that one. That one is not ever going to be reconciled. Uh, to me because I don't know how someone can conditionally place value on your wedding vows. Uh, to, to me, you either do or you don't. But it's a weird code that, hey, she, she ended up uh, you know, living and dying by it, and, and, and so did Mike. Mike with his code uh, on there first and foremost to put his boss in mortal danger. 
uh, once he realized that his boss had uh, sold out uh, the, the crime family, so to speak. And then upon hearing Catherine's rant about loyalty, realizing that he owed Wynn the loyalty to try to, to spare his life and at least give him the chance to get away and maybe let somebody else finish the job. So what, what Boyd did, I, I think, just stands in even more stark contrast uh, to those two. You know, the the Catherine thing, glad you brought that up. Um, I'm fine with people living by a code, whether we're talking about criminals or, you know, uh, military vets. They, I, you can live by whatever code you want. But when you're looking at it and saying, I'm going to kill you because you are responsible for the death of my former husband that I didn't love enough to stay faithful to, I got a problem with that, um, just on a personal level. But the way things are shaping up with Catherine now out of the mix, we have no idea just how deep the rabbit hole goes on the craziness that is Avery Markham. And we still don't even know if this is going to come down to Raylan B. Boyd anymore. This episode was phenomenal, and it set up more episodes than they're going to have to give us. So a phenomenal day. It really, really was. You know, and as as, as Catherine Hale and her uh, deceased husband are now uh, at, at that place down below, uh, each standing there sipping a hot toddy. I find it hard to believe that he's looking over and saying, hey, thanks a lot, Skank, for doing right by me in the end there. You know, I, I don't think that's exactly how he would define a proper way of uh, marital fidelity and the way that you should uh, stand by your spouse. Uh, yeah, again, too little too late, even though she ended up giving up her wife to uh, – try to do that. And realistically, this is Catherine Hale. It was as much about proving a point as anything else. Let's not glorify her too much here for, you know, she died out of a, you know, an attempt to avenge her husband. At that point, it was, hey, Mike, you peon, get out of my way and let me finish my business. It was as much that as anything else. And Mike standing up to her and sort of defying what she saw as his station in life. And, And again, for Mike, a guy who was always deferential, I come back to that as well. You know, he was pretty deferential with her almost until the minute that the gun started firing. Well, we're not used to seeing this. Part of the reason it was a shock when he jumped win last week is that he always had the attitude of the consummate second banana. So Mike going alpha in ways that were consistently surprising over the course of the last two episodes here. You talk about a character that didn't have a huge real arc coming into this thing going on on a big, big high note. I don't know that anybody in the course of this show, if you think back on it, took bigger, significant leaps in their last two episodes than did uh, the late lamented Mike. Yeah, no, this was a big, big moment for him, and it hopefully helped to, uh, pardon the pun, but justify his existence here as being anything other than a second banana peon type. Um, So uh, big for him as well. And, uh, again, the show just keeps uh, surprising us in pleasant ways because Mike, you know, imagine when wind, wind breaks free and wind kills him, end of story, you don't think anything of it. But the way this went down was something different entirely. And uh, not saying he was a good character, but uh, there was some redeemable value at the end. Well, in our last uh, minute or two remaining here, just kind of set the, the, the board going into the last two episodes, they're, they're paring things down here as we continue to take pieces off the board. Catherine, Mike, uh, tonight it was uh, Carl, but you've got Earl, who is uh, in custody now and, and potentially prepared to testify against both Boyd and Avery, but you still have uh, Avery and Boone out there. You have Loretta in danger. You have... Boyd out there in the wind like you knew that he would be. Same thing with Ava and Zach Randolph. You got uh, Raylan trying to catch them before he becomes more or less a fugitive himself. Two episodes to go. What do you think? Um, I I think that I'm still affected by the shock of the idea that the title of the episode, number one fugitive, fugitive, will end up being Raylan of all people. I'm still blown away with the idea that we may be looking at a situation where Art is chasing Raylan. That just blows me away. Well, there's there's something we never saw coming. I'll tell you. There, you know, even even at their lowest point, 
uh, last year. That's something we wouldn't have seen coming. And then he was in semi-retirement for so long, recovering from the thing. Uh, Jason, if that's if that's part of the end game, won't that be one of the biggest shockers they could give us? Absolutely, because we've always kept this this idea that as adversarial as they were last season, this was still almost a surrogate father son relationship. So this is completely crazy. And then when you add in all the things you just mentioned from Loretta to Avery, I have no idea how they wrap this up in two episodes, but that, again, will be the beauty of it. I got to think the last one might be a 90-minute one. For as much as Sons of Anarchy ran over on a regular basis their last season, uh, this one here, for as much as it's made it tough doing the show some nights with the 15-minute runovers, they haven't abused the privilege as much as Sons of Anarchy. I got to think there's going to be more of that coming, though, the last two uh, weeks, because uh, what else would you be saving it for? So we have that to look forward to. And again, uh, with these two great episodes, I'm sure two more great post shows with you. As I said, we'll also do a season recap after that. Maybe we'll get Ken Detweiler in for that one with us as well. So just a little bit yet to go in our live recap uh, coverage of Justified. Uh, a pleasure as always, my man. Great to get back on with you tonight and break things down the way that I knew we would. Absolutely. It's going to be a big one next week, obviously. The penultimate episode in the entire history of Justified. We'll be here to bring it to you, uh, recap it afterwards, and break it down. For Jason Jones, I'm Rick Morris. Thank you so much for joining us for FDH Lounge mini episode 544 and also this jointly produced episode with not just another TV site.com. As we bring the show to a close, we would like to extend our deepest gratitude to NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, All Clear Channel affiliates, TNT, TBS, USA, UPN, Deadspin.com, YouTube.com, YTMND.com, MySpace.com, various blogs, Fox News, CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, IamBoard.com, Billboard.com, Google.com, ESPN, ESPN2, ESPN News, ESPN Classic, NBA TV, NFL Network, Sports Time Ohio, Athlon Magazine, Comedy Central, Cartoon Network, The Boomerang Channel, QVC, BET, The Spice Channel, Steno Notebooks, Manwich, Papermate Office Supplies, Waitresses, Strippers, Bartenders, Garbage Men, Janitors, Microwave Popcorn, The Writers of The Office, Scrubs, Entourage, My Name is Earl, Oz, Metalocalypse and the Boondocks, Aquafina, and The Periodic Table of Elements.